Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to be discussing the biosynthesis, the function, and any clinical applications of coenzyme Q, or sometimes called CoQ. Now, coenzyme Q is a coenzyme that is absolutely necessary in the electron transport chain in humans and many other organisms. So any cell that we have that utilizes an electron transport chain has an absolute dependency on coenzyme Q. And yes, we get some coenzyme Q from the diet, but it's too important to not have a biosynthetic pathway for it. So let's briefly go over this pathway. The first thing we have to do is build the isoprenoids. And the two basic building blocks of isoprenoids are number one, isopentanyl pyrophosphate or IPP, and then this one, dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate or DMAP. And so we begin with acetyl-CoA. Two molecules of acetyl-CoA are condensed into acetoacetyl-CoA by thiolase. And then HMG-CoA synthase is going to convert acetoacetyl-CoA with an additional acetyl group from acetyl-CoA into HMG-CoA, which is beta-hydroxy, beta-methyl, glutaryl-CoA. Then we have the committed step in coenzyme Q synthesis and really a bunch of other lipids like cholesterol, vitamin D. And this committed step is HMG-CoA reductase, which uses NADPH to convert HMG-CoA into mevalonate. Once you get to mevalonate, this pathway is not reversible. So you can't go back to acetyl-CoA. You're committed to basically building something, whether it's cholesterol, vitamin D, or in this case, coenzyme Q. So mevalonate kinase uses ATP to phosphorylate mevalonate and make 5-phosphomevalonate. 5-phosphomevalonate kinase then phosphorylates the phosphate on here to make 5 pyrophosphomevalonate, and then 5 pyrophosphomevalonate decarboxylase uh, removes the carboxyl group and forms this 5-carbon molecule, which is isopentanyl pyrophosphate. This is one of those basic building blocks of the isoprenoids. And so in order to make the other building blocks, some of the IEPPs are isomerized into DMAPs, or dimethyl allyl pyrophosphates, by IPP isomerase. And so there's an equilibrium between these two basic building blocks. Now, this enzyme, FPP synthase, this is farnesyl pyrophosphate synthase. This actually condenses one IPP and one DMAP, and it makes this larger isoprenoid called geraniol pyrophosphate, or GPP. And then again with this FPP synthase, this is actually the reaction that its name is based on, it actually creates farnesyl pyrophosphate, or FPP, from geraniol pyrophosphate. It's actually at farnesyl pyrophosphate that we see a big branch point in metabolism. So we can either continue along this pathway, and this will ultimately lead us to coenzyme Q, but it turns out that farnesyl pyrophosphate can continue through a different pathway by the reaction of squalene synthase to make cholesterol. And so what you see is that cholesterol, and therefore vitamin D, and also coenzyme Q ultimately are derived from the same pathway. Okay, and that committed step is HMG-CoA reductase. We'll come back to this for a clinical application at the end of the video. But keep in mind that all of those molecules are made via the same pathway, and they diverge at this metabolite, which is farnesyl pyrophosphate. Now, there's some other condensation reactions that occur to make bigger and larger isoprenoids, and the one that we're going to terminate at is called decaprenyl pyrophosphate. And these reactions occur in the cytoplasm, so decaprenyl pyrophosphate will then be transported into the mitochondria, as you see right here. And so this decaprenyl pyrophosphate is one of the major precursors to coenzyme Q. The other precursor is this molecule, which is called 4-hydroxybenzoic acid, or parahydroxybenzoic acid. You can see that right here. Its precursor is tyrosine. Now, you can see there's a question mark there, and there's actually several question marks throughout this picture. So this pathway is not completely 
elucidated all the details of it. It is known that it does happen. We do as humans synthesize coenzyme Q, but some of the details have not yet been worked out. So somehow tyrosine is converted into parahydroxybenzoic acid and that's moved into the mitochondria. Whether or not this reaction it takes place in the cytosol and it's moved in, or tyrosine moves in and then the reaction takes place is not known. But now we have our two precursors, parahydroxybenzoic acid and decaprineal pyrophosphate. And then we go throughout this pathway. And not to get into the little bitty details here, but what I want you to notice is that the pathway really consists of enzymes that belong to this large multi-enzyme complex where each subunit that has a specific function is given CoQ plus a number. In the center, we have the core, which is CoQ4, and then around it we have CoQ2, 6, and so on and so forth with a number designation. And so if we go throughout this pathway, the reactions are catalyzed by CoQ2, 6, 3, there's two unknown reactions, and then 5, 7, and then 3 again over here, and then we get the mature coenzyme Q. Now there are a few things to look out for here. And the first is the first reaction right here in the mitochondria, and that's catalyzed by CoQ2. This is the reaction that's responsible for adding the decaprenial group onto this carbon of the benzene ring right there. You can actually see it over here, abbreviated as prenyl 10. This does not mean it has 10 carbons, it has 10 isoprene units. So it's a very long carbon chain, and that's the first thing that's added. Pretty much all the other reactions are really responsible uh, for either hydroxylating the ring or in some cases methylating those hydroxyl groups. And so we end up with the final product over here. Here's our CoQ ring. And you'll notice that this carbon, we have that prenyl group that was added in the first reaction by CoQ2. On either side right here, we have a hydroxyl group. Those are going to be very important for the function of coenzyme Q. Between the hydroxyl group and the prenyl group, we have just a methyl group. And then over here on the other side, we have hydroxymethyl groups. So each one was originally a hydroxyl group. You can see one of them right there, but then it gets methylated. And then you can see another hydroxyl group right there, and again, it gets methylated. Okay? And once you have this coenzyme Q, there's a couple binding proteins, 10A and 10B, that pick it up because it's a very hydrophobic molecule, and it's transported to the inner membrane of the mitochondria to specific proteins like NADH dehydrogenase, which is complex 1 of the mitochondria. Um, complex 2 will also utilize it as well as complex 3. So over here on the right is the initial coenzyme Q that's made. So we have the methyl group right here. We have two hydroxyl groups on opposite sides of the benzene ring, and then two hydroxymethyl groups uh, between the hydroxyl groups. And then we have that isoprene tail. You'll notice we put this in parentheses because it's very long. Notice that every isoprene unit is five carbons. Four right here and then one up top, so five. And there's 10 of those. So it's a very, very large chain that's going to amount to about 50 carbons. So we obviously abbreviate it. Now, when we have these two uh, oxygens here as hydroxyl groups, we term this form of coenzyme Q as the reduced form. And you'll see why in a minute. So when you have these two hydroxyl groups, this is the reduced form and sometimes abbreviated QH2 or we call it ubiquinol, okay? Now over here on the far left, you'll notice that both of those hydroxyl groups are now ketones. They're double bonds between carbons and oxygen atoms. And then compared to the ubiquinol over here with the completely aromatic benzene ring, now we only have two double bonds in the ring, but we have these two ketones, these two double bond oxygens. Those are the two things to look out for, those two double bonded oxygens. When you have both of those, you know that your coenzyme Q is in the oxidized form. And it's usually given the abbreviation Q or termed ubiquinone. And then we have the semiquinone form, or semiquinone intermediate. This is actually an intermediate redox state between the oxidized CoQ and the reduced CoQ. And you'll know you have this when one of these oxygens, normally the one most distant from the isoprenoid chain, has a radical electron. You'll see it right there. There's our radical. 
So one of them will have a radical and the other one will either be written as a hydroxyl group or an oxygen with a negative charge. Here it's an OH, uh, but the key is the other one has a radical electron. You'll notice the benzene ring is still there, but the big thing to look out for is that oxygen with the radical. When you have that, you know you're dealing with the semiquinone intermediate. And it's usually given the abbreviation QH with a little dot to denote that it is a radical. Now, how exactly do these electron transfers actually occur? Well, let's actually take an example enzyme. This will actually be what happens in complex one or NADH dehydrogenase in the mitochondrial electron transport chain. So NADH dehydrogenase is going to receive electrons from NADH. So NADH is our reduced cofactor. And what NADH is going to do in the mechanism of the enzyme is it's going to transfer two electrons to flavin mononucleotide. FMN is going to be a coenzyme of complex one. And so the two electrons from NADH are going to be transferred to FMN. You'll notice here for FMN, which is initially in the oxidized state, we've got these two nitrogens right here, and they both have these conjugated double bonds. Okay? When FMN gets reduced by the electrons from NADH, that is two electrons, you'll notice here that the double bond actually moves to right in the middle, right there. And now both of these nitrogens have a hydrogen. This means that FMN is in the reduced state. And since this is a redox reaction, the NADH is oxidized into its oxidized form, or NAD+, like this. So NADH becomes oxidized, FMN becomes reduced. And now FMN has those two electrons that were originally on NADH. Okay. Now, one of the things about NADH is that it's very limited in how it can transfer electrons. And the same thing goes for NADPH. The NADs can only transfer two electrons. Okay. So they can pick up two electrons from something, or they can donate, as in here, two electrons. Now let's see how reduced flavin mononucleotide plays in with coenzyme Q in this enzyme. So now we have FMN in the reduced state. We can tell because we've got that one double bond and these two nitrogens each have a hydrogen. This is reduced FMN. And down here is coenzyme Q in the oxidized state. Okay? So this orientation has been flipped upside down relative to here, but we can tell it's oxidized CoQ or ubiquinone because these two oxygens right here are double bond oxygens. They are ketones. So this is coenzyme Q in the oxidized form. Now, with FMN and FAD, doesn't matter, the flavins are different from NAD and NADP because they can transfer one or two electrons. So the flavins are a little bit more uh, diverse in how they function. But here, they're going to be transferring one electron at a time. And so in this case, for complex one, FMN will transfer one electron to oxidize CoQ. So FMN loses one electron, CoQ will gain one electron. And when FMN loses one electron, it also has a semiquinonoid form, which is a radical form. You see the radical electron right there. This is the semiquinonoid form of FMN. You see the one double bond right here, but then there's that radical electron right there. And then the coenzyme Q is going to pick up one electron, and you see that radical electron on this oxygen right there, and then the OH down here at the bottom. So that means that this is the semiquinonoid form of CoQ. So we've gone from the left one over here, the ubiquinone, to the semiquinone intermediate. Now, this is technically a mistake right here. I got this off the internet. Understand that this should actually be an aromatic benzene ring at this point, like it is up here. But really, when you're looking at the structure, the main thing to look at is that radical electron. Okay? Now we're going to get one more electron transfer in the same direction. So this semiquinone FMN is going to transfer one more electron to the semiquinonoid CoQ. And so now we restore the oxidized form of FMN that we had at the beginning of the catalytic cycle. We have these two nitrogens here and two conjugated double bonds. This is the oxidized form of FMN. And that one electron went to the semiquinonoid of coenzyme Q. And now we have the reduced form of coenzyme Q. We know it's reduced because we have these two hydroxyl groups on either side. And we can term this one ubiquinol. Now, ubiquinol is the reduced coenzyme in the electron transport chain. So it can go and move along the plasma membrane and it will deliver electrons to a different complex, which in humans is complex three. 
But the whole point here is that NADH can transfer electrons to FMN two at a time, and then FMN can transfer electrons to coenzyme Q1 at a time, and it just cycles through these three oxidation states. And when the coenzyme Q in the reduced form, ubiquinol, gets to complex three, it's going to deliver electrons and move in the reverse direction to regenerate ubiquinone. And that's the whole point of coenzyme Q. It can pick up electrons and it can donate electrons, and it does so in the electron transport chain in any cell that has an electron transport chain. Now just to think about this for a second, pretty much all of our cells have an electron transport chain with very few exceptions. The exceptions might be erythrocytes, so red blood cells, or platelets. But since the vast majority of our cells utilize electron transport chains, this coenzyme is extremely important. And so we can get coenzyme Q through the diet, but having this biosynthetic pathway is extremely important. Sometimes the diet is not going to be enough. Now, one clinical application of this is the statin medication. Now, remember, I mentioned that at farnesyl pyrophosphate, this is a branch point in metabolism because, yes, this can be converted to a larger isoprenoid and we can get CoQ biosynthesis, but farnesyl pyrophosphate can react with another enzyme called squalene synthase, which leads us toward cholesterol and vitamin D, in particular cholesterol. Now, we have these statin medications. And statin medications inhibit this enzyme, hmg coa reductase. This is the committed step in cholesterol synthesis. And so if we inhibit this enzyme, then cholesterol synthesis is going to drop. Because if we think about it like this, this is our branch point, And this is going to ultimately lead us to cholesterol, right? And that's through a multitude of enzymes. So if we shut off this enzyme, cholesterol synthesis also stops. But what's another side effect of using statins to inhibit HMG-CoA reductase? Well, not only are we shutting off cholesterol synthesis, we're also going to be shutting off the production of farnesyl pyrophosphate and all this. And so we're going to lose out on coenzyme Q. So one of the side effects of statins biochemically is we see a drastic reduction in the synthesis of coenzyme Q. Now remember, coenzyme Q is absolutely necessary for any cell that uses, utilizes the electron transport chain and aerobic metabolism. Can you think of a tissue type that is almost solely dependent on aerobic metabolism? Cardiac muscle. And so what can happen with statins if you're not getting adequate coenzyme Q is you can actually develop heart problems secondary to a deficiency of coenzyme Q. And so you've probably seen commercials on TV that if you're taking a statin drug, you might also want to supplement coenzyme Q. And this is not the only supplement you could use, and you probably want to verify that it's a good supplement, but that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. The basic idea is if you're using a statin and you're inhibiting this enzyme, you're shutting off not only cholesterol synthesis, but also coenzyme Q synthesis, among other things. And so you'll probably want to supplement coenzyme Q. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of coenzyme Q's function, its biosynthesis, and what might happen if you're on statin therapy. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.